Good afternoon. Good afternoon. The first item of business today is portfolio questions. Uh, rural economy and connectivity. Yes, can just, can members hear me? No. Can I just check the microphones? Can you hear me now? Oh, there we are, right, good. We have takeoff. Uh, well, sort of do, because question one has been withdrawn and the member's not present for question two. So we'll go to question three. Question three, Graham Day. To ask the Scottish Government what impact the installation of average speed cameras between Dundee and Stonehaven will have on road safety for communities living alongside the A90. Minister Hamza Yusuf. A comparative assessment of average speed cameras, uh, average speed camera technology on uh, other routes demonstrates that introducing ASC technology uh, can, of course, realise a range of benefits for local communities, including reduced incident frequency and impact. Uh, improved journey time reliability and speed limit compliance with consequent reductions in the number of people killed uh, or indeed seriously injured. Average speed cameras in the A90 will result in improved driver behaviour, fewer fines uh, and points for drivers and most importantly of course uh, safer roads for local communities and indeed all users uh, of the A90. Graham Day. Uh, thank you. As the Minister knows from correspondence between us, exiting and entering the A90 via a series of junctions in the Teewing area of my constituency can be fraught with difficulty and the road layout situation is exacerbated both by the presence of slow moving farm machinery and pedestrians having to cross the carriageway at the village of Inbaraldi access southbound buses. There have been a number of serious, some fatal traffic uh, incidents in the vicinity in recent years. And whilst I understand that road layout was not a significant contributor in the vast majority of these, the fact remains this is not a stretch of road that users feel comfortable on. I very much welcome the Minister confirming to me in a letter yesterday that given the accident cluster, further investigations are to be carried out. But can I ask, will all of the junctions in the vicinity be looked at and not just the tailing turn off? And might the options to be considered include introducing a 50 mile per hour speed limit in this area, something which has already been done elsewhere on the A90 at Lawrence Kirk? Minister. I thank the member uh, for that question. I also thank him for his correspondence uh, over uh, the months uh, on this issue. And he'll know that there was, of course, a recent fatality uh, tailing and tailing community council. Uh, have, uh, have uh, uh, mentioned that to me uh, and can I just say of course that in these incidents uh, when, these, when these happen that our thoughts are first and foremost with the families uh, of those affected. Uh, road safety is of course of paramount importance, that is our number one uh, objective uh, in the work that we do. We assess safety performance on the trunk road network including the A90 junctions and have identified the A90 Teeling Junction for further investigations, uh, as the member uh, alluded to in his questions. Our operating company have arranged to meet with Teeling Community Council in July to gather feedback, which will help to inform uh, the report. The study, uh, study was actually previously undertaken in, in 2012. Um, this recommended signing improvements at uh, Inveraldi and New Biggin and Teeling Junctions, which were installed uh, in 2012. But I can give them assurance uh, that uh, the scope uh, can be widened, and I'll certainly look uh, to do that and I'll speak to my officials about widening that and uh, we will continue to engage with stakeholders there. If at any point the member feels that there could be further engagement with other stakeholders, I would of course welcome him getting back in touch with me on that. Ross Thompson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Minister provide Parliament with a timeline for the completion of the improvements to the A90 junction at Lawrence Kirk? Minister. Well, the member will know it's going through uh, the, the statutory process, and I would often have this conversation with uh, uh, the, his late colleague and our late colleague, Alex Johnson, who, who uh, would rightly, of course, uh, be, be pushing me for a further time scale. But it is going through uh, the statutory process. I'm happy to write to the member to explain to him. I'm sure he'll be aware of, of some of this, but the detail of that statutory process. The danger, of course, would be that if we subverted that statutory process, I'm sure he would be the first one to jump down our throat and say, look, you have to listen to the objections or otherwise of, 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 of local communities. So we have to follow that uh, statutory procedure. I do know that people in Lawrence Kirk, as my colleague Marie Evans has often mentioned to me, do feel somewhat skeptical uh, about whether or not the project will take off. I can give them an absolute assurance that will. We've committed the, the, the funding for that, but I will write to the member so that he has a little bit more detail uh, on that process that must be followed. And hopefully that will give him the reassurances he requires. Mark Ruskell. Thank you. Um, the Minister will be aware of a pilot pro project in Edinburgh to use average speed cameras uh, to deter uh, rather than to detect uh, breaches of the speed limit in an urban setting, um, particularly applied to 40 and 30 mile an hour limits. Um, is the Scottish Government also looking at how average speed cameras can be used 
to uh, deter speeding within 20 mile an hour zones within urban areas. Minister. I'm not aware of having looked at uh, looking at average speed cameras for a 20 mile per hour zone, but again, uh, if the member would wish me to do, I'm more than happy to have a discussion with Transport Scotland. But it would be fair to say that looking at average speed camera technology is not just for rural settings, uh, but indeed also for urban settings where they can drastically reduce uh, the incidence of serious and fatal uh, incidents. So uh, I haven't looked at them for 20 mile per hour zones. Uh, if the member wishes me to do so, of course, he can uh, correspond with me and, and I'll happily have that conversation with Transport Scotland. Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. Can the Minister advise me what the impact, what impact the installation of average speed cameras on the A9 between Inverness and Perth has had on fatalities, serious accidents and people caught driving over the speed limit? Minister. We just had recent statistics come, come, come out on this and uh, they have been very positive in relation to the reduction uh, of serious and, and fatal incidents uh, on, on the A9, which I'll come to in just a second. And it's worth saying that um, you know, when, when uh, average speed camera technology was first rolled out in the A9, there was many detractors, many of those who objected uh, to it. I think the statistics now speak for themselves. Yeah. Uh, and that is why when we are looking yeah. to install average speed cameras in the A90, uh, on the Dundee to Stonehaven uh, route, uh, there has been little in the way uh, of objection. In terms of answering the member's question directly, uh, for the last 27 months since the installation, we've seen uh, serious and fatal uh, casualties between Dunblane and Inverness down by 43%. Mm. There have been no fatal casualties between Dunblane and Perth in the last reporting period, and a reduction of almost 40% in fatal casualties between Perth and Inverness over the same time. So we'll continue to monitor that data, but I think everybody would agree uh, that those average speed <laughs> cameras have been a great success. And as I say, I hope that when we roll them out in the A90 to, between Dundee and Stonehaven, we see very similar reductions in casualties and fatalities. And, and Liam Kerr. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, the Minister will have seen the Press and Journal report this week on accidents on the A952 Cortes Junction, A90 Mintlaw to Fraserburgh Road. Uh, there are two deaths or serious injuries per month. Uh, Graham Day rightly highlights uh, the junction at Teeling, and the Minister gave a, a, a reassuring and, and uh, positive answer. Uh, can the Minister give similar assurances about this stretch of road and what will be done to prevent further serious injury and death going forward? Minister. Uh, you know, the, 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 the accident uh, statistics and the road safety statistics uh, are, of course, uh, paramount when we come to make a decision on where. Uh, our average speed camera technology should be rolled out. Uh, that is the basis and that is the fundamental reason why we do what we do and where we choose to invest. You'll understand we have, of course, a finite uh, resource. Uh, that's why we have to concentrate it on where we uh, can reduce those fatalities and those casualties the most. And the statistics on the A90 are horrifying for any uh, uh, member uh, to see and therefore uh, I'm very hopeful that the action that we take will reduce that. If any members, and it's not just for Liam Kerr, but any members across this chamber uh, feel that there's a strong case uh, for their communities uh, to, to, to have uh, traffic calming measures, to have average speed camera technology rollout, et cetera, et cetera. I would, of course, uh, welcome them to come towards me uh, with the caveat, of course, that we do have that finite resource. But where there is a sensible option to help to reduce fatalities, to reduce serious incidents uh, and accidents and injuries, that this government will always take that as, as a priority. Question number four, Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the rollout of superfast broadband in the Strathkelvin and Bearsden constituency. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. Uh, Presiding Officer, the £400 million investment that the Scottish Government and our partners are making through the Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband Programme will extend fibre broadband access to at least 95% of premises by the end of this year. Without that investment, only Two-thirds, only 66% of premises would have been reached. Although most of the super-fast broadband rollout in the Strathkelvin and Bearsden constituency is being delivered commercially, by the end of last year, the programme had provided fibre broadband access to 7,450 premises in the area, 94% of which were capable of accessing super-fast speeds. Rona Mackay. Thank you for that answer. Um, many constituents who live in the Woodley village in Lensey and those in other rural areas in, the, in my constituency have raised concerns at my local surgeries over the rollout of superfast broadband. Can the Cabinet Secretary give reassurances to these constituents that they will have access to superfast broadband within the time frame set out, time frame set out by the Scottish Government? Cabinet Secretary. 
Um, well, I, I can say that the Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband Programme has further fibre broadband deployment planned for Woodley Village in Lenzie. Any premises not connected through the Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband Programme will, of course, be captured, uh, Presiding Officer, through our commitment to deliver 100% superfast broadband access by 2021. Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that update. Uh, one of the most important pieces uh, of, in this jigsaw is achieving 100% rollout for our small and medium-sized businesses, especially in rural areas. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what specific measures the government will take to ensure that small business is very much at the forefront of any future rollout uh, in the R100 programme? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, of course, we, we uh, value the, the work that small businesses do, and that's why we have the most generous business relates package for small businesses under our uh, rates relief programme anywhere in the UK. So, of course, we are determined that they should have access because, in many cases, that access will be critical to the eff effective conduct of their business. Uh, and, of course, the R100 programme aims to extend access to every house and every business premises uh, by the end of this year. And as the Cabinet Secretary responsible, I'm determined that every premise should have that access, presiding officer. Question number five, Dean Lockhart. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will implement the recommendations in full of the Audit Scotland report principles for a digital future when taking forward its R100 contracts. Cabinet Secretary. While the Audit Scotland report in question focuses primarily on lessons learned from previous procurements of IT systems and services, I'm pleased to confirm that the five key principles set out in that report are indeed reflected in our planning for the R100 programme. The R100 work will, of course, build on our existing Digital Scotland programme, and members may also be aware that when Audit Scotland reviewed progress of this programme, Audit Scotland concluded that we are on track to meet our coverage targets with more premises than expected able to access superfast speeds. Ofcom's most recent Connected Nations report for Scotland also highlighted that superfast broadband coverage in Scotland had increased presiding officer by 14% over the last 12 months, the largest increase of any of the UK nations. Dean Lockhart. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. In the report, Audit Scotland, in view of the cost overruns and challenges experienced in a number of recent IT projects, uh, required the, the government going forward to set out clear leadership that sets the tone and culture and provides accountability as well as setting out appropriate governance structures and sufficient project oversight for future IT projects. Can the Cabinet Secretary therefore outline what specific steps he is taking to ensure that these recommendations will be implemented in full? Cabinet Secretary. Well, one might uh, uh, conclude from what the member has just said that Audit Scotland was critical of the Scottish Government's work in respect of rollout of broadband. That is not the case. The member is talking about another Audit Scotland report because Audit Scotland's report on our work on this programme, broadband, concluded, and I quote, good progress has been made and we remain on track to meet our targets. So far from being critical of the government, yeah. as the Conservative member seeks uh, to imply, in fact, Audit Scotland praised the work that the Scottish government has done and the record that we've achieved. And maybe that's why, uh, that's because Nearly three quarters of a million people, presiding officer, uh, houses and businesses, now have access to superfan broadband exactly because of the efficacy and the effectiveness of that programme which this government carried out. Yeah. Marie Todd. Thank Was it me? Marie Todd. <laughs> Marie Todd. <laughs> Beg your pardon, David. <laughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm really pleased to hear that the Scottish Government is on track to deliver fibre access to at least 95% of premises in Scotland by the end of 2017. Can I ask how this compares to how many homes would have received fibre access if the Government had decided not to intervene? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, the, the total of the premises that would not have access had we not intervened are 740,000. And I may point out, Presiding Officer, that uh, the uh, broadband and indeed mobile telephony, they're not actually devolved, they're reserved. Yeah. If we'd waited for the UK to act, 
we would be waiting for Godot, wouldn't we? Uh, and we would not have seen nearly three quarters of a million premises having the access that they now have. We didn't wait because we weren't prepared to wait because we know how important it is to rural Scotland. The Tories are shaking their heads. That's because they don't like the facts. Yeah. They prefer their own smears to the facts when they hear them. Uh, we will continue to deliver good progress in rural Scotland uh, whilst the Conservatives uh, snipe from the sidelines. Yeah. Now, question number six, David Torrance. <laughs> Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to encourage new plantings in forestry. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government has taken positive action, including an increase in grant funding for woodland creation of £4 million, additional funding for the Timber Transport Fund, more attractive grant rates for native woodlands in remote areas, an increased threshold for requiring EIA screening in low sensitivity areas and implementation of the McKinnon Report to streamline the planting approval process. The result of this, presiding officer, has been a substantial increase in the number of future woodland creation projects being developed and an enthusiastic response from across the forestry sector. David Torrance. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware that Labour has committed to planting one million trees of native species across the UK and that the Conservatives are intended to plant 11 million? Can the Cabinet Secretary advise how these targets compare with the Scottish Government's action on planting trees of native species in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I don't think they, they compare particularly favourably, but, but having said that, I'm very keen that we should, across this chamber, approach uh, the, uh, the opportunities that forestry provides in a consensual fashion. Uh, and that's why I'm pleased that the Scottish Government target of planting 10,000 hectares per annum rising by to, to 15,000 are uh, aims that can be shared uh, across this chamber. I wasn't aware of the Labour uh, target putting a specific figure on it, but I do hope that they've got that figure right. Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, Cabinet Secretary, you, you just accused us uh, on these benches of, of saying about facts and, and not smears. Well, let's give you some facts towards planting. In the last five years, Every year you failed to meet the planting target. In fact, you're 28% under what you set yourself. It seems difficult for us to have confidence in your target of reaching 12,000 hectares by 2020. If you haven't reached that, will you make up the shortfall by increasing the plantings to make up the deficit that have been achieved over the last five years? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, well, of course, uh, we, we have set ambitious targets. I had thought that this was a matter of... Uh, of common ground amongst the political parties, but the, the member wants to make some political points instead. Um, if, I, if I could inject a few facts into, into, if I could inject a few facts into the interchange, could I point out that the, the uh, shortfall in respect of the former plantations was not a result of the inadequacy of grant applications. It was because of the insufficiency of applications for new plantings. We can't grow trees without applications. We need the applications to grow more trees. Fortunately, because of the steps that have been taken over the last year of increasing the grant funding, increase, increasing the timber, well, Mr. Uh, the gentleman doesn't like it, but we're increasing the timber transport fund. I thought he supported that by increasing the funding for broadleaf plantations, by increasing the threshold uh, uh, below which uh, screening is not required in sensitive areas. And finally, by implementation of the 20 recommendations of the McKinnon Report, we have built up uh, an atmosphere uh, uh, conducive to investment. And all the signals I'm getting from the many meetings that I hold, and I've held three forestry summits over the past year, are positive. And I understand that we should be very close to reaching our target shortly. I thought that that good news is something that even the Conservatives even would welcome. Question number seven, Stuart Stevenson. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to protect inshore fisheries for, against unlicensed commercial fishing. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, measures under the shellfish restrictions on taking by unlicensed fishing boats, Scotland Order 2017, came into force on the 17th of April this year. They place restrictions on quantities of shellfish that unlicensed fishing boats can take. These measures support the right of people to enjoy fishing as a hobby, 
establishing daily catch limits, provide clarity, and they tackle the issue of unlicensed illegal commercial fishing conducted under the guise of hobby fishing. And to enforce these measures, Marine Scotland Compliance uses rigid inflatable boats, ribs, and conducts regular inshore patrols. Stuart Stevens. Um, can I uh, thank the uh, Cabinet Secretary for uh, advice of that particular order, which I'm sure will be uh, welcomed. Um, can I assert that, of course, our inshore fisheries play an important part in our rural economy and provide absolutely superb food? Will the recently announced uh, pilots uh, seek to improve inshore fisheries and will they help us make further improvements to support our coastal communities? Cabinet Secretary. Well, yes, I believe that the pilots will. We want to see our fishermen and communities make the most of our inshore resource and that's what the inshore fisheries pilots that were announced uh, recently aim to achieve. They'll explore two different management approaches to determine what works in terms of delivering greater economic, social and environmental benefits to coastal communities and our uh, rural economy. And to explore a more localised approach to fisheries management where fisheries interests work together to develop distinct arrangements which meet their needs. The learning from these pilots, presiding officer, will help inform a more strategic approach to managing inshore fisheries to ensure that we make the most from our valuable inshore waters and inform work of the future of fisheries management in Scotland in the next few years. Finlay Carson, can I just check, is this a supplementary on the... It is. Finlay Carson. Thanks, President Officer. In my constituency of Galloway and Western Fleet, illegal electrofishing is taking place regularly in Fleet and Loose Bay with potentially huge, hugely damaging effects on the long-term sustainability of the stocks. The Scottish Government has totally failed to control this. Indeed, some razor fishermen are concerned that stocks may be unrecoverable if the illegal fishing continues. Now, I understand there are planned trials of electrofishing in selected areas, but what steps are being taken to protect the areas not in the trial areas from continued illegal fishing? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, we, we are taking steps to ensure that uh, electrofishing is properly dealt with and uh, that uh, pilots are, are carried out in order to demonstrate under strict regulation whether or not the conduct of fisheries by these methods can be safely and sustainably pursued. This is a measure that we are taking. I had thought that my meetings with the members uh, were uh, uh, an indication that we were not dealing with this in a party political way. Perhaps uh, I'm too naive in that respect, because they now appear to be. Uh, but irrespective of that, I will continue to ensure that the Scottish Government does our best to respect the interests both of communities, the environment, uh, and the inshore fisheries uh, fishermen, uh, and we will continue to work in the way that we've explained to Mr. Carson on several occasions. Thank you. We move now to environment, climate change and land reform questions. Question number one, Donald Cameron. <coughs> to ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made in resolving the dispute between seafarers and management at Marine Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. Uh, constructive discussions are continuing between the Scottish Government and the recognised trade unions. We do remain optimistic that this matter can be resolved amicably and without industrial action taking place. Marine Scotland mariners, of course, play a vital role in the protection of Scotland's seas, and the Scottish Government is very appreciative of the difficult work they undertake in helping to protect Scotland's marine environment and resources. Donald Cameron. <coughs> I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. But representatives from both Marine Scotland and Unite the Union feel there is a distinct lack of action being taken by the Scottish Government to resolve this. Given there is now a real likelihood that industrial action will take place, what steps is the Government taking to avoid this happening by considering fairness between Marine Scotland seafarers and other public sector seafaring staff? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Marine Scotland management agreed in April to continue to pay the recruitment and retention allowance, which is at the heart of this, at the current rate until the end of October 2017, which is when the business case for continuation of the supplement would need to return to the pay supplement panel for consideration and approval. And extending the allowance until October uh, does allow time for Marine Scotland to continue to assess recruitment and retention issues in the sector and to allow the trade unions time to work in partnership with the Scottish Government on the pay comparability exercise, uh, which is what is happening. Question number two, Liam MacArthur. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it will introduce the first pilot schemes for the management of the seabed. Cabinet Secretary. 
We recently consulted on the long-term arrangements for management of Crown Estate assets in Scotland. Uh, the consultation contained our proposals on how Crown Estate assets in Scotland can be managed differently in future. Uh, the Government is involved in discussions with the three wholly island authorities on potential pilot arrangements for enhancing local management of Crown Estate assets. Any proposal needs to contain appropriate arrangements and sufficient detail on how assets and liabilities would be managed. I've also received inquiries from communities in the Western Isles uh, and I remain interested in hearing about proposals for other community pilots. Lee MacArthur. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response as she knows there's a very strong and long-standing desire within Orkney for local control over the seabed assets. There's a desire shared by the communities in Shetland and the Western Isles who remain keen to take forward pilot projects under an agency agreement with Orkney. I welcome Rosanna Cunningham's uh, willingness to engage with myself and Tavish Scott as well as the island authorities themselves on this issue, but can she clarify who specifically will make the decision on where any pilot projects will take place and can she commit to ensuring that these are in place before the end of the calendar year? Cabinet Secretary. Well, from 1st April 2017, uh, Crown Estate Scotland Interim Management has been managing the assets in Scotland. On that basis, the proposals on any potential pilot will be taken forward directly with the new body. I confirm that my officials will continue to be involved and they will participate in discussions between the island authorities and Crown Estate Scotland interim management on the possible pilot arrangements. And because it's a, a, a discussion involving uh, the interim management body, I don't think it would be right for me to commit to a timetable uh, on this. Finlay Carson. Scotland is home to approximately 25% of Europe's offshore wind resources. With management of the Crown Estate seabed assets now being devolved, what steps will the Scottish Government take to ensure the ongoing viability of these existing assets? Cabinet Secretary. Well, it would help enormously, of course, if the UK Government was to play slightly uh, um, more fairly on the issue of renewables vis-à-vis uh, -vis Scotland. Uh, Crown Estate uh, assets will continue to be managed on a commercial basis until such times as the, uh, any changes are brought about by the subsequent uh, 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 consultation and subsequent uh, legislation. Uh, but uh, I, I think for, uh, for anybody on the Conservative benches to be challenging uh, anybody in Scotland in respect of renewables, I find quite astonishing. Question number three, Christina McKelvey. To ask the Scottish Government what action is taken to tackle wildlife crime. Cabinet Secretary. Members will be aware that in August of last year I commissioned a report to ascertain whether there was any suspicious pattern of activity associated with reports of the disappearance of satellite-tagged golden eagles. That report is being published this afternoon on the Scottish Natural Heritage website. Its findings are extremely concerning, in particular that between 2004 and 2016 almost one-third of the 131 young eagles tracked have disappeared under suspicious circumstances. And its conclusion that illegal killing is the most likely explanation for the disappearance of these birds and that there are clusters of disappearances associated with some driven grouse moors. This report provides clear evidence of deliberate and sustained illegal persecution in some parts of Scotland associated with those driven grouse, uh, with driven grouse shooting. Christina McKelvey. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and welcome the report being published this afternoon. I'm sure many of us will be interested in reading its findings. But in light of some of the findings the Cabinet Secretary has already outlined, could you tell us what specific steps she will take now to target those who continue to flout the law by killing birds of prey and damaging the reputation of decent, hard-working landowners, managers and gamekeepers in the process? Cabinet Secretary. Well, presiding Officer, in the light of this report and the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee's recent recommendation on licensing of shooting businesses, I can inform members that we will be introducing a number of measures to build on those we've adopted over the past few years. Now, these new measures include publishing a map showing the clusters of disappeared birds, asking Scottish Natural Heritage and my officials to explore options using existing powers, which could be used to order the temporary or permanent cessation of activities linked to grouse moor management, where we have good reason to believe that they are harming highly protected raptor species, enhancing enforcement and prevention by working with Police Scotland to recruit a team of special constables focused on wildlife and other rural crime. And after careful consideration, I've decided that this is a better route than giving further investigative powers to SSPCA inspectors 
I am, of course, very grateful to the SSPCA for their public spirited offer and their patience while we've considered the proposal. I also want to establish a group to examine how we can ensure that grouse moor management continues to contribute to the rural economy while being environmentally sustainable and compliant with the law. We're commissioning research into the benefits and costs of large shooting estates to Scotland's economy and biodiversity. And of course, last but by no means least, I want to examine ways in which we can protect the employment and other rights of gamekeepers and their role in enhancing biodiversity, not just uh, game interests. I'll be announcing more details of these proposals in due course. David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. While I generally accept the points the Cabinet Secretary has made, I am disappointed that she's not willing to extend the powers of the Scottish SPCA inspectors to investigate wildlife crime. Given the new evidence about the appalling scale of persecution of Scotland's birds of prey, surely extending this power is a power whose time has come. We need to investigate more, not less, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary. Um, I understand uh, that David Stewart has a, a strong opinion about that. There are, however, considerable difficulties involved in, in bending the law of evidence in Scotland to begin to allow the kinds of evidence that uh, 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 might be uh, brought forward. And, and we've seen in recent weeks how if that doesn't work properly, then it can jeopardise uh, potential court cases. Um, and in my view, a better way forward is to use the existing uh, 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 law, the, the, the existing investigation uh, uh, authority, the police. They have the powers already. They can do the things that uh, need to be done. Um, I, I should also point out to David Stewart that uh, choosing to go down the route of SSPCA uh, powers um, would open the door to potentially others wanting the same powers. Uh, would create a big question mark over admissibility of evidence much more widely and would require primary legislation which would take a considerable amount of time to bring forward. Question number four, Bob Doris. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how its Climate Challenge Fund supports projects in Glasgow, Maryhill and Springburn constituency. Cabinet Secretary. Since 2008, the Climate Challenge Fund has provided funding of £3.9 million to support 37 community projects in the Glasgow, Maryhill and Springburn constituency. Bob Doris. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and I commend the impressive level of investment benefiting my constituents and draw attention in particular to the award of £139,199 to Lamb House Stables based at the 4th and Clyde Canal in my constituency. Can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to visit Lamb House Stables to see for herself how the funding for the Growing Together in Greener Lamb Hill project is actively promoting and supporting lifestyle changes in the community by providing food growing spaces in their allotments, cycling and outdoor activities through their bike workshop and youth clubs, all with a green thread running through each activity by educating and showing how we can all lead more carbon friendly lives. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm well aware of the good work Lamb Hill Stables is doing helping to reduce local emissions in the north of Glasgow. Uh, and it's an example of how successful uh, the Climate Challenge Fund has been uh, across many different communities in Scotland. I was pleased to approve funding of £140,000 this year for the project supporting the community to grow their own food and allotments and make use of derelict and underused land. And I have visited other projects doing a similar thing now. Uh, I, I think in a lot of communities, it's an enormous benefit uh, to get that uh, community growing, uh, uh, become part and parcel uh, of particularly urban communities. Uh, I am, of course, open to invitations. Uh, if the member wishes to write to me with a formal invitation, I'll ensure that my diary is consulted appropriately. Morris Golden. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Could the Cabinet Secretary confirm whether an assessment has been undertaken to compare the impact of Climate Challenge Fund spend versus other climate change mitigation measures, such as peatland restoration? Cabinet Secretary. Um, uh, just uh, off the top of my head, I'm not conscious that we have uh, looked at those two things, which are quite separate. Um, I mean, obviously, the Climate Challenge Fund has, uh, has particular aims and objectives uh, beyond just the climate challenge issue, because the Climate Challenge Fund has an important socioeconomic uh, argument to make, particularly in communities where there might not be anything else that links them to the arguments about climate challenge. It's as much an educational uh, development as it is uh, anything else. Um, we do regular assessments of the Climate Challenge Fund. Uh, the members raised an interesting question about that kind of cross-comparison. 
Uh, I'll ask officials whether or not it is something which is appropriately done. It may not be something that can be easily done. Uh, and we'll see whether or not there is a way to, to, to look at that, uh, in which case I would come back to him with more detail. Question number five, Angus MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made following community requests to have a permanent SEPA presence in Grangemouth. Cabinet Secretary. SEPA staff play an important role in regulating industrial and other activity in the Grangemouth area, supporting the health and well-being of local communities. Following discussion with the Community Council and local elected members, SEPA is considering the benefits and costs of establishing a Grangemouth site that can support the wider Stirling-based area team. Angus MacDonald. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her uh, reply. She's clearly aware that I facilitated a problem-solving partnership recently involving SEPA, Falkirk Council and Grangemouth Community Council on this issue. And I'm pleased to report that SEPA have engaged positively and proactively with the local community. Clearly, the Grangemouth community has lived cheek by jowl with the petrochemical and agrochemical industries for decades, and recognition has to be given to that. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that proper acknowledgement and consideration must be made by the government and public bodies such as SEPA that there's a community of 18,000 people living in Grangemouth who all deserve to continue to live in a healthy environment and that the town's not just an industrial cash cow to boost Scotland's GDP? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I do welcome Agnes MacDonald's actions with the Grangemouth community to work in partnership with others to seek solutions. I am clear that my government will place communities and environmental sustainability at the centre of our plans for economic growth. SEPA have an important role to play in this as Scotland's principal environmental regulator, and I do welcome Angus MacDonald's recognition of their positive contribution, and I know he will continue to be uh, actively involved and interested in the conversations which are currently ongoing about what may be the outcome in terms of uh, uh, moving the, uh, or at least having a base in Grangemouth. Question number six, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to tackle illegal snares and traps. Cabinet Secretary. The setting of snares and traps must be undertaken in accordance with Section 11 of the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981 and with the Spring Traps Approval Scotland Order 2011, respectively. Enforcement of this legislation is the responsibility of Police Scotland. Through the Partnership for Action Against Wildlife Crime in Scotland, PAW Scotland, uh, the Scottish Government works together with key stakeholders, including Police Scotland, land managers and conservation bodies, to tackle wildlife crime in Scotland. Claire Adamson. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary, for that answer. Um, she may be aware of a horrific incident near Ravenscraig Regional Sports Centre in my constituency where an 18-month Sprocker Spaniel, Evie, had her chest ripped open in what is a suspected deer snare. Can the Cabinet Secretary give advice to pet owners about how to keep their animals safe and also um, give advice on how to report such incidents to ensure that the police can deal with these effectively? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, in terms of keeping uh, one's pet animal safe, I mean, quite clearly, uh, I suppose one has to be very, if you're taking an animal out, making sure it's not out of your sight uh, and, and knowing where you're going in the first place uh, in terms of... Uh, uh, the kind of land that you're on. Um, what, what I, I, I am aware of the individual incident that the uh, member uh, refers to, and I hope uh, that that was immediately reported to the police. If reporting to the police is the, is the most important thing that people can do uh, most immediately, and, and ordinary people uh, will be our eyes and ears in a lot of rural Scotland, if this, uh, uh, um, as well as uh, in other areas. So I think that it's... Uh, uh, extremely important that we impress on people that when they see anything that does look suspicious, uh, that that's what they do. Um, the independent working group on scare, uh, snares did note that there were numbers of non-target species caught in, in snares, but we think that can be reduced through training, through careful attention to best practice, and to awareness and alertness on the part of ordinary people. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Can I refer members to my register of interest and my membership of the League Against Cruel Sports? The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the, the disappointment that the recent Government Commission review into snaring by Scottish Natural Heritage failed to properly assess the impact on animal welfare of snaring. Will the Cabinet Secretary ensure SNH revisit the report and this time consider all the evidence available of both legal and illegal snaring and the impact it has on animal welfare of target and non-target species. Better still, will the Cabinet Secretary listen to the overwhelming view of the public and consult on a total ban on snaring and accept you can't regulate cruelty? Cabinet Secretary. 
Well, I think as I indicated in the members' debate uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we all accept that predator control, all forms of predator control will have their drawbacks. Uh, none of these methods of control are particularly uh, uh, um, attractive things to have to do, uh, but in large parts of Scotland they are uh, regrettably uh, necessary. The, the recent review um, referred to by the member, which was undertaken by SNH, um, what was a review that uh, arose entirely out of previous legislation and was dictated by that legislation. So the terms of that review um, were, were part and parcel uh, of the, uh, the, the, the previous legislation. So, uh, you know, uh, the SNH were not uh, doing a complete review of all snaring. Uh, um, that, that wasn't uh, the, uh, 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 the, the requirement. So um, I appreciate this will go on being a live debate. I understand people have very strong views on either sides, but uh, one of the issues that we have to consider is managing uh, 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 effectively business in the countryside. Uh, and unfortunately, thus far, we haven't seen a predator control uh, that will do uh, as good a job as this does. Question number seven, Adam Tompkins. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it's making um, in meeting its emissions reduction targets. Cabinet Secretary. We're making splendid progress. The latest statistics on Scottish greenhouse gas emissions published in June last year show that the statutory emissions reduction target for 2014 was met and the reductions from baseline levels exceeded the level of the interim 2020 target. Statistics for 2015 will be published on 13th of June. Adam Tompkins. Thank you for that answer. She'll be aware the Scottish Conservatives have called for a range of measures uh, to be introduced to incentivise the uptake of electric vehicles in Scotland to reduce emissions. Uh, but increased levels of uptake will mean increasing levels of demand on our power networks, particularly at peak times. How is the Scottish Government working with electricity companies to mitigate this concern in the long term? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm, I'm sure my colleague, uh, the Minister for Transport, would be able to give you a, a considerably more detailed answer than, uh, uh, than I am. I have just seen a, a report about the extended network for electric vehicles, which uh, uh, I think in Scotland uh, is beginning to look uh, rather, rather good. Um, I think we're making uh, great strides. Uh, yes, there is an issue uh, in terms of uh, continued power use, but of course the more of that power that we can produce from renewables, uh, the less of a problem it will be uh, in respect of climate change emissions. Thank you very much, and that concludes portfolio questions.